What is going on everyone? Today we have Stephen Keneally from Fidelity Investments to come and talk about how AI is impacting quality engineering. Now this is something that I didn't know much about or really how you even start to apply it. And it's really interesting because it is a practical use case of AI being used out in the world today. So we're gonna get his POV, some of the impacts that he sees AI making within quality engineering and learn a bit more about how you can also get started with it. So let's jump right in. Stephen, how's it going my friend? Can you hear me? Good. How are you, Corey? Ah, I'm doing fantastic. I appreciate you taking the time out to chat today. I was just telling everyone that um, I saw your presentation on uh, AI's impact to the software yes. development lifecycle, specifically with quality engineering, um, and found it fascinating. So really, really appreciate you taking the time out to come and chat. Uh, and yeah, I got a few things I would love to cover, but if not, would love for you to give a quick background on yourself. Sure. Um, so I am Stephen. I am a software quality lead in Fidelity Investment. I have been in quality for 15 years now. Um, a lot of the time was spent in the engineering. Um, and I've transitioned into leadership role in the last few years. And with my role now, it's more about strategic uh, thinking, how we approach quality, uh, what changes we can make in our automation approach, um, things like that. Uh, in the last few years, the introduction of ChatGPT has sparked an interest in AI. Um, AI is not exactly new, but the interest in AI is new. And I've kind of run with that. I've uh, recently completed a postgrad certificate in AI for professionals. And I'm, I'm leaning on that now for introducing AI into QE processes and the SELC as a whole. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and yeah, I think the, the whole, you know, the Cambrian explosion of AI is cool again on the backs of um, ChatGPT has the whole, has the whole world kind of running on it, but just like make sure that I'm clear because I have not spent much time in the quality world. I was, uh, a background's in engineering. So I spent time breaking things for y'all to, <laughs> to find and fix, but just to, like, uh, you know, the 50,000 foot, when we say quality engineering, like what bases are we covering here? Yeah, absolutely. So it's funny you say you were breaking things because in the past I would have used that line in my interviews. So I would have seen dev as the people who were creating and I would have been trying to break it. Uh, that has changed. That has evolved over the last 10 years, 15 years. So we are focusing now on shifting left. And what we mean by that is not breaking the code, but ensuring it's built correctly in the first place. So we are putting in uh, processes to ensure high quality from the very beginning. And that doesn't mean we aren't still testing it. We are still testing it. So once the code comes to us, we perform manual and automated tests uh, to ensure that it is working as expected and that the user can't break it uh, when it gets to them. So we are just ensuring the high quality uh, throughout the entire process from start to finish. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, so that helps, that helps, which is, I mean, that's a lot, right? Um, and I saw in your previous presentation, you had a, um, you made a comment, you know, that, that QE cannot test everything. There's just too much. It's just like an insane amount of data, which I'm sure that no matter what size company you're at, it's a lot to kind of overcome. Um, so in your mind and from what you've seen, like how is AI like helping quality engineering like overcome this challenge of just having too much, like too much data, too much that like you can't, there's no human way to provide all the test coverage. Um, so mm -hmm. where have you seen or where have maybe you tried injecting AI to help support that? Well, there's, there's two paths. There's one. That I, I envision that we can go down with happening right now. So one path which is I've seen happen right now is gaining efficiency through AI. And most of that is through um, LNMs and GPT tools, whether it be Microsoft Copilot, GPT, um, GitHub Copilot, whatever it might be. And we're gaining efficiency there through automating tasks that were currently manual. So a lot of the tasks within QE are manual, test case creation, mm. um, documentation, uh, test, test data creation whatever it might be. So leveraging these LLMs and these GPT tools to um, automate those steps and reducing the time it takes for us to get to the actual testing stage is where we can see gains already and what we can leverage right now. Uh, what I see for the future uh, falls under two main brackets of AI. Uh, maybe it's one big bracket of AI called predictive analytics and uh, adaptive testing. So we can leverage these predictive analytics to predict how the code will behave, spot mm -hmm. where defects may exist, reuse old data, test logs, defect logs, identify area, problem areas that will require a uh, higher focus 
allow us to adapt our testing approach to uh, focus in on those key areas, um, allow the adaptive testing to um, adapt our automated code to any code changes that come in that are expected to allow us to step away from maintenance and allow us to focus on that whole approach I was talking about earlier, where we're not just testing the code, we're implementing processes for the entire team to follow right. to ensure quality at a higher level. I see. Interesting. Well, so um, to give me like some concreteness, right? So like when you say using AI to generate um, tests, right? Or maybe it's like acceptance test or something like, can you just walk me through how you do that today? Is it like, is it literally just like, hey, here's the requirements that came out of, you know, the initial like scoping or requirements phase we take like one of those user stories and then we'll, you know, leverage AI to help support, write The test case for it. And then we're done. Or is it like, Hey, you know, maybe we like, I don't know. I don't know if you like can like did the devs like, Hey, this code is supposed to do this. So you like grab that and then feed parts of it into an AI and be like, does this work? Like just so I can tangibly understand when you say using yeah. AI for test test coverage. So it, it sounds as straightforward as that. You would take your acceptance criteria, whatever the story that the dev are working on, the queue you're working on the same story, you take your acceptance criteria, you feed that into uh, a GPT tool, and you give it context, mm. which is important for all uh, interacting with AI. Don't just give an acceptance criteria and expect an outcome. Tell it, I am a quality engineer. These are my acceptance criteria. I need to generate positive, negative edge test cases, whatever your need might be. And it will generate those test cases for you to review. Uh, they may not be exactly as you need, but they will uh, get you on your way and get you 90% of the way. This is where the expertise of the QE comes in to understand exactly what you need. So you know as a QE what you need. This is just doing it faster for you. You review that, and then you build your automation or your test cases built on that. Um, what, it, what was the second part of the question? Uh, like, so, so, is, so is creating the test coverage like really piggybacking on like the requirements, or is there some like crazy wave that test coverage happens by actually feeding in code as well to like test? I wouldn't say crazy, <laughs> but it absolutely is a way that you can do it. And it's an idea that I would like to see investigated further. So the idea, the first idea is you use your acceptance criteria and you just automate the manual process of generating your test cases. The second is your idea there is you just scan the code and generate the, mm -hmm. the automation code to get that. That's absolutely possible. Um, it's uh, it's a different way of doing it, and these different ways of doing things using AI require someone to take a risk, to take a chance, to actually try them and prove it out. Um, and that's the step that I think we're at now. And I'm not just talking about where I work; I'm talking about across the industry. Right. Um, taking that leap from. Why are we doing all these steps in between when we can just use a code and, and test that directly or create test cases directly based on that? Mm -hmm. Well, so how does that then, because that is really cool, right? Like, um, so how do you see that? So like, let's say that we pull that thread a little longer, right? Um, that in the future, it's less about creating test cases off of requirements, um, but it becomes more dynamic in that you're actually creating the, the code itself has influence on what the testing does because like I, mean, I think that we all know like sometimes what actually ends up getting built like varies from what was originally scoped at the beginning of the project so it's like it doesn't really get this match matching so how do you like let's say that that happens We're hypothesizing out here it follows yes. into the clouds um how do you see like the qe role changing if that becomes it like do the skill sets change too does it is it drastically night and day different it isn't drastically night and day understanding quality and what that means that's not going to change and what you're talking about there is is putting guardrails in place so again we're talking about shifting left and having quality involved at the very start or as early as possible so before the code is created and you talk about code matching requirements that conversation has had multiple times. It's not just in refinement. It's not just in planning. Uh, after planning, the QE should sit down, and this should happen regardless of any AI involved. The QE sits down with the dev, sits down with someone close to the requirements, whether it be a BA and SA at the squad lead, 
and you all agree this is the expected outcome this is what the coverage should look like and then you proceed and with all of that agreed let ai do its thing let it take the hardship out of the steps and have the qe and the dev review so again you need the expert view of this is the expectation yes this makes sense no it doesn't change it as needs be so um, a lot of what i'm going to talk about a lot, a lot of my talking points all come back to this point that ai cannot go and do it by itself we can't trust it yet you have to be the voice of uh, expertise will say in the room to say yes or no and that's where the qe will come into play and again being that almost like the conscience of the squad <laughs> keeping everyone honest allow them to focus on that side so it's the shift is going to be not so much away from technical but more towards personable as well and being strong communicators strong advocates for doing it the right way um which is something i'd like to see anyways mm -hmm. gotcha no that um yeah, I think that the whole keeping the human in the loop is still very much the theme across every place that people are sh cramming and shoving AI in. So that's good to hear that it's consistent there. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd like to move on to another one. And I pulled this from, again, another one of your presentations because it really uh, piqued my interest. But this idea of self-healing automation, it sounds awesome. Um, yes. And... You know, when I first heard it, I was like, I don't know what this exactly means, but it sounds really cool and I'm kind of into it. And then what we were, but now that we were just talking of this idea that requirements that get written up front don't always match the code that gets built and that code that gets built may change over time. And therefore, like, it's not going to be this like quality then of what is right differs. Am I tracking here or like when... Uh, 100% tracking. Okay. Um, Top of you're adding on the size of the app. And it's not just changes in requirements from expected expectations now, but as the, as the app grows and dependencies grow across the application to other applications, that needs to be taken into account as well. Mm -hmm. What we're seeing or what we'd like to see is the focus on maintenance, which could make up 25, 30% of a QE's time and in a sprint or outside of sprint, that could nearly be demolished. If we have code that can adapt to changes in what it's testing, it's simply a matter of the QE reviewing, mm -hmm. saying, yeah, that is expected. That, that's not a defect being introduced. Let's change the test case to match. And then we click go. And that will be that'll be that job done. Um on top of that as well, you might be looking at test case or test data creation or ensuring the test data exists, but there, there are other avenues that there are other overheads that we have to explore anyways. Mm -hmm. um, that may help in different ways. Um, so really it's this idea that like as you write it, you write a test once, you link it to some functionality in the code and maybe the, like the baseline requirements. And then as the code changes, the test itself will update to reflect Kind of this new expected behavior and that's insane that like 25 to 30 percent of the time is spent on just maintaining that's low that's a low um right that's a low in that figure yeah. it could be more and i'm uh, sure that it, what qe to dev is depending on what changes have gone in dependencies upstream downstream it could be more gotcha yeah and, and like, well, go, no, go on i'm just saying that the the framework itself could need maintenance and changes in in libraries things like that we could automate that process as well then we're really onto something right 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 um and the other thing that i see this potential theme on um across like the self-healing automation you know being able to cut out a lot of the that like grunt work you know where it's like the not hard just the monotonous work that people have to mm -hmm. do uh, and then by doing that, you, it, it seems a lot about being predictive. Uh, and you had brought up before around predictive analytics um, and that it's kind of this holy grail. Uh, mm -hmm. And so what did you, what do you mean by holy grail? Sure. So again, we'll come back to the shift left and QE's wanting to be proactive rather than reactive. And being proactive means being able to predict how something will behave, how it will change, 
what what path you go down when it comes to testing. And if you introduce predictive analytics with your algorithms, which can analyze fast quantities of data, spot trends, and give you predictions based on those trends, you can then lever leverage that within quality in the SCLC. So there's a number of ways you can leverage. Uh, the first is through sentiment analysis. So you have your front end user, they give you feedback. They give you mountains of feedback. You analyze that data and say, this is a problem area. This is something we need to focus on. And that will allow the dev and the squads and the QEs all to focus in that area. And then when we're actually building the application, we can then leverage predictive analytics on, on, on error logs, on defect reports, spot areas where there's high defect density. So an area where there has to be focus. And again, allows you to structure your approach towards that. So it, it's all about focusing in on the problem areas. Um, and this comes back to your very first question about not being able to test everything. Because we can't test everything, we have to come up with risk analysis. And this would all feed back into that. And then finally, well, not finally, but another layer of that would be production incidents. So we'll see it as a loop. Mm -hmm. so you have your sentiment analysis, you have your focus on testing, and any of your production incidents. If you're a production support, you are under pressure to get things fixed ASAP. If you can have predictive analytics on top of years of data, say, this is a problem area, this is your most likely outcome on how to solve it, try this. You could save hundreds of hours uh, in, in months, in quarters, whatever it might be. Uh, and again, millions of dollars, whatever it might be, in solving these problems and getting the solution out there ASAP. Mm -hmm. Predictive analytics for, in terms of quality, that, yeah, that is a holy grail thing for me. So it's almost that idea of, you know, 